please turn your Bibles to the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 5, chapter 5. We'll read verses 3 to 12. We will only be studying 10, 11, and 12. Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 5, verses, we'll read verses 3 to 12, but we will only be um, meditating, studying 10, 11, and 12. I'll read along. Uh, please follow along. I'll read. Please follow along. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in spirit, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for, re for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let us pray. Our gracious God, our Heavenly Father, this morning we come to your feet. Father, we thank you for this uh, precious time you've given us to open thy word. Lord, we understand many are in darkness. You've given us your word. Your word is a light, a lamp unto our feet. In your light we see light. With thee is the fountain of life. This morning we pray that as we sit here, that you would shine your light in our hearts. Expel the darkness. Give us humility to submit to your light. Lord, speak to us this morning. Have mercy upon us. Let none walk here not visited by you. Pray that you would visit us, Lord, this morning. Father, remember us, have mercy on us, make us live. We commit ourselves to you. Father, remember me as I speak your word. I pray that you would give me wisdom, you would give me your spirit. Lord, pray that your people would be built up in holiness, in righteousness, in truth. I ask for your help. In the name of Jesus. Our Lord and our Savior, I pray. Amen. A healthy question to constantly ask ourselves is, am I a Christian? It's a healthy question. A lot of people don't ask themselves, am I a true Christian? Am I a true child of God? Am I a true child of God? A lot of people presume that they are children of God. From time to time, we need to have a healthy practice called introspection, examination. And we have to ask ourselves this question. Am I a child of God? Am I a Christian? In Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 to 10, the portrait is given of a Christian. Together, all these statements make up the Christian. It's a description of a Christian. The Christian, I do not mean in any way, in certificates we see Hindu, Christian, Muslim, right? That's not what I mean. What I mean is, Christian means Christ follower. Christian, another synonymous, child of God, right? I mean it in that sense. These verses 3 to 10 holistically give the picture of a what we call a biblical Christian, a Christ follower, a child of God. And essentially, you can at a broad level you can put them in two buckets, right? Two buckets. First bucket is a person in his relationship to God. A person in relationship to God. Verses 3 
all the way to 8. This person is seeing himself in the light of God and he's examining himself and he's saying he's discriminating. Do I see these attributes provided here in seed form? Do I see these characteristics in seed form? We are not looking at perfection. The Sermon on the Mount. If we truly examine ourselves, nobody is able to meet the standard. Rather, what we are examining is, are they visible? Are these characteristics visible in seed form? Are they growing in me with each passing day? This, this bucket, a person's relationship to God. Quickly, right? The first beatitude. There's a reason it's the first beatitude. This is where the Christian life begins. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. A Christian is a man who has seen he has no righteousness in him. He is top to bottom sin. His way is the way of destruction. He has seen his total moral bankruptcy. And he has come and he has fallen at, at the foot of God, at the foot of Christ, at the foot of the cross and saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. That's where the Christian life starts. As long as we say, I have this, I have that, my father is this, my mother is this, you're not a Christian. The primary thing about a Christian is, I am top to bottom sin. I have no hope apart from the mercy of God. That's where the Christian life begins. That's where total humility, total. And when we come with that attitude, this free gift is given. Justification by faith alone in Christ alone. Free gift of righteousness given to this helpless, poor, miserable, naked sinner. And you can go on with the rest of the qualities, right? He, he is mourning over his sin. He is meek. He now, in this new relationship to God, he says no to sin. He is hungering and thirsting after righteousness. He is merciful to others. Why? Because he has received infinite mercy from God. A guy who cannot forgive others is simply showing that he himself is not forgiven. A person who says he is a Christian and is not able to forgive us is just betraying himself. He is claiming to be forgiven, but he is not forgiving. So mercy is a characteristic of a Christian. Pure in heart. God is holy. His people are to be holy. Pure in heart. Characteristic of a Christian. And then there is this purity of heart. God is pure. I am a child of God. I must inculcate purity in my inner life. I must prepare myself for that beautiful vision of God when I am going to be in His pure presence one day. That's the first bucket. Second bucket. The Christian is also defined in terms of his position in this world. In this world. As he lives in this world, he has experienced something. He has peace with God. His sin is pardoned. He is in a new position. He is a child of God. He calls God his father. He has experienced the kindness, the goodness, everything beautiful about God in his own personal life. Now what he wants to do is, he wants others to have this as well. So he is trying to reconcile or he is trying to share the message so that others would be reconciled to God. In this world, his primary objective is to give the gospel, to be a peacemaker between God and sinners because he's already experienced it. Another way to define a Christian, to complete the portrait is, 
his relationship to the world which is in verse 10. That's the focus of our study this morning. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Yes, he wants to make peace between sinners and God. He wants to share the gospel. How does the world react to this person? The answer is verse 10. Blessed are those who have been per persecuted for the sake of righteousness. The world, as he tries to be this peacemaker, he is persecuted. What is persecution? There's a difference between punishment and persecution. We should not conflate them. Punishment is giving the due reward to a mistake. You break a law, the law says, if you break the law, this is the punishment. Persecution is getting unfair treatment without any offense, without anything you have done. You have not done anything wrong, but you are unfairly treated, you are ill-treated, you are harassed, pain is inflicted upon you. There's no fault of yours, but you are persecuted. Your pain is inflicted upon you. The Lord is saying the Christian is a man who is not punished, but who is persecuted without any fault of his in this world. I also make, want to make one more distinction. A lot of times people create pain for themselves. A lot of times people choose to disobey God. God gives a specific instruction. They say, no, I'm wiser than God. I don't want to listen to God. And they will, as a result of sin, invite the consequences of sin upon their life. And all of a sudden they think they are persecuted. That's not persecution. Persecution is you do everything you are required by God and then you are unfairly treated. The Christian, according to the Lord, is a man who does everything right and then he is fairly untreated. He is, he is fairly mistreated. He is fairly... Christian is a man who does everything right, but in spite of all his rightness, he is unfairly treated. Let me, let me give you an example of a man who is talking about persecution. I'm going, I want you to, you'll find this throughout the Psalms, but let's look at one particular verse. Um, Psalm 59. Here's a man who is persecuted. Deliver me from those, Psalm 59 verse 2, Deliver me from those who do iniquity. Save me from men of bloodshed. For behold, they have set an ambush for my life. Fierce men launch an attack against me. And listen to what he says. Not for my transgression. Not for my sin. Why is this man suffering? Why is the psalmist, in this case David, suffering? He's clearly saying, fierce men are launching an attack against me, Lord. And he's saying, for no guilt of mine, no transgression of mine, no sin of mine. Verse 4, he says, no guilt of mine. They run and they set themselves against me. Arouse yourself to help me and see. Persecution. Christian does everything right, yet he is he is unfairly treated. The cause of his persecution, according to the Lord, is two things. We read in verse 10, 
blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. They are persecuted because of righteousness. What is righteousness? Righteousness is the state of being right. What is right? God's law is right. God's law is holy. The commandment is, let us turn to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Sorry, Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7 verse 12. So then, the law is holy, the commandment is holy and righteous and good. A Christian is a man who sees the beauty of God's law, beauty of God's commandments. He says God's commandments are right. I will submit myself to those commandments. He is working righteousness in his life. Because he is working righteousness in his life, he is unfairly treated. He is persecuted. Second thing the Lord says, what is, what is true persecution? It is because the person is righteous. He is trying to follow the will of the Lord. Secondly, the Lord says in verse 11, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. This Christian is mistreated because of Christ's sake, on account of Christ's sake. This believer saw the folly of his sin. He came to Christ. He asked for pardon. He asked Christ to make him a new creation. Christ had made him a new creation. Now he says, God has Christ, God in Christ has freely saved me. I am bought with a price. I am not my own. I belong to Christ. I give my all to Christ. I will follow everything Christ tells me out of gratitude. And as he is doing this, following Christ as a Christ follower, he is persecuted. Again, I want to emphasize, don't confuse punishment and persecution. Don't confuse self-inflicted pain and persecution. It's very important. The promises here is only for those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for Christ's sake. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And that is a true Christian. Now, as we look at these verses, what are the different forms of persecution? We see. In verse 11, we see a form of persecution. People insult you. People mock you. People say falsely all kinds of evil against you. This is a form of persecution. And throughout scriptures, we see different forms of persecution. Mocking because you are a righteous man. False accusations because you are following the Lord. We see in Hebrews 10, the writer of Hebrews was telling the Hebrew Christians, you remember your former days, you were faithful, you were willing to suffer with those who were going into prison, you joyfully accepted the seizure of your property. In, in other words, they had means of living, they had properties. This persecution, all their properties were confiscated. They were mistreated. So, confiscation of property. In your job, if you are mistreated because you are a Christian, you are discriminated because you are a Christian, that is a persecution. Imprisonment, we see the Apostle Paul many times writing from prison. I, Paul, a prisoner for the sake of the gospel. We know many brothers and sisters today across the world, in China, in Africa, are in jail because of their faith, imprisonment, because they choose to believe the Lord Jesus Christ, they are in prison, they are tortured. That's persecution. We see of examples where people are murdered 
because they are Christians. Graham Staines murdered because he is a Christian. His children murdered because they are Christians. Stephen murdered because they are Christians. These are all different sorts of persecution. But the common theme is they are unfairly treated without any guilt, without any transgression, any sin in them. The Lord is saying, blessed are you, blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. So we talked about the Christian who is being persecuted. Who is the persecutor? Verse 11, blessed are you when our translators supply the word men or in King James Version, we the translators supplied the word men. In modern translations, the word supplied is blessed are you when people insult you. Right? It says men, modern translation, people. Notice it doesn't say when blessed are you when the world persecutes you. Okay, did you see the distinction? There's a distinction between world and men. The, the translators supply the word men or people. So in other words, the persecution, when we think of persecution, we are always thinking the world. The world is anti-God, therefore it persecutes. No, that's not what here the scriptures divinely inspired are saying. They just The scriptures just use the word, don't use the word meaning men. They don't use any word. So it could be anyone, not necessarily the worldly person. It could be anyone. So from whom can we expect persecution? Let me give you three broad buckets. Obviously the unbelieving world. The unbelieving world. Paul is in, in a town called Ephesus. People are becoming Christians. People are tur turning away from idols. They're becoming Christians. There's a man by the name Demetrius. He says, Paul is preaching the gospel. You know, many people are becoming Christians. They are forsaking idols. We will lose our livelihood. This is what we are going to do. We are going to persecute Paul the preacher. Paul had not. Paul was just preaching the gospel. Here were people living in sin. He was turning their life from sin to a way of righteousness, to a way of peace. Nothing wrong. But Demetrius, what does he do? He stirs up a mob. He says, come, let's attack the Apostle Paul from the world. And today we see many places, the anti-Christian governments, our own nation, persecuting believers for no fault of theirs. Persecution can come from the world. That's very, very obvious. Persecution can come from false brethren in the church. Let me uh, read. Let us turn to 3rd John. 3rd John. We'll read verses 9 and 10. 9 and 10. So this person is supposed to be a pastor. His name is Diotrephus, right? I'm going to read verse 9 and 10. I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephus, or Diotrephus, who loves to be the first among them, does not accept what we say. For this reason, if I come, I will call attention to his deeds, which he does, unjustly accusing us with wicked words. And not satisfied with this, he himself does not receive the brethren either or he forbids those who desire to do so and puts them out of the church. Apparently this man was in a position of authority. And he was speaking ill, evil. He is making unjust accusations against the apostle John. So we see false brethren. In the church, any church, in the visible church, 
until the end of time there are going to be false professors the lord jesus himself said on the last day the angels will separate the true and the false the false brethren persecute the true christian the false the false professors persecute the true christian the third bucket of people who persecute the christian and i would call this immature believers the apostle paul had to deal with the corinthians he calls them you you are all carnal one fellow says i am of paul one fellow says i am of paulas one fellow says i am kephas and you developed a party spirit that now you hold on to this one person and you say and you downplay you you downplay the the other apostles you create factions some false teacher comes and says something bad about me you go and you multiply it you 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 share it with the rest of the church and you defame me you have many many tutors i am your spiritual father i shared the gospel with you i poured out my life to you you instead of knowing who am i who i am your only your father with all the sacrifice I, i i gave the gospel you speak ill of me you mistreat me so we see the corinthian believers immature believers even speaking against their father their spiritual father who are the persecutors three buckets unbelieving world false professors immature believers and the question at this point should be why the christian is righteous what is wrong with being righteous what's wrong with being holy why is the christian persecuted The scripture's answer is this. Let us turn to Romans chapter 8 verse 7. Why does the world persecute the believer? Why does false brethren persecute the believer? Why does immature believers persecute believers? Here's the answer. Verse 7. The mind set on the flesh is hostile toward god this is the answer sin nature the mindset on the flesh sin is hostile is at enmity with god it does not want following continue the verse it does not subject itself to the law of god nor it is even able to do so the sin nature it rebels against god anything to do with god it hates it so it is hostile toward god and the things associated with god the ch- the christian the child of god is associated with god therefore the sin nature hates the children of god listen to our lord's words john chapter 3 verse 19 20 this is the condemnation this is the judgment that light has come into the world men love the darkness rather than the light for their de- for their deeds were evil why does the not uh, the unbeliever why does the false brethren why does the immature believer persecute the tr- true child of god men love the darkness rather than 
the light for their deeds are evil verse 20 everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed when light comes before us when we are in the dark it exposes our darkness it exposes the vileness of our sin our ego is hurt so what does we do? what do we do instead of humbly saying lord i am a sinner be merciful to me what do we do we in pride say i must extinguish the light if only i extinguish the light my darkness is not exposed and we take every opportunity to extinguish the light that is why the christian is persecuted turn with me to john chapter 7 verse 7 these are the words of the lord again he is explaining why the christian is persecuted why does the world hate the christian why does the world hate god john chapter 7 verse 7 the world cannot hate you but it hates me because i testify of it that its deeds are evil there is a testimony of evil the world is so proud it doesn't want its darkness exposed so what does it do let's let's extinguish quench the light so that my darkness is not exposed my deeds are not exposed and that is the reason dear ones the christian is persecuted if you are walking in the light all those who desire to live godly lives will be persecuted second timothy 3:12 this if you want to understand this world this is it the conflict between the righteous and the unrighteous the christian is always persecuted remember in genesis 3:15 the Lord God is speaking a word to the devil and he is prophesying human history. What is the course of human history? What is the course of human history? Here is the course for human history. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. There is going to be two groups of people, the devil's seed and the Messiah's or Christ's line. Christ is a representative there, right? In him all his people are, right? This is it. There is going to be enmity between the devil's line, the devil's seed, the world, the false brethren, and the true children of God, those who belong to Christ. Now, this is in the first family you will see this truth, this enmity between righteousness and evil. Turn me, turn with me to First John, First John chapter three, verse twelve. The apostle is saying, we should not, we should love one another. We should not be as Cain. This is what he says in verse twelve. Not as Cain, who was of the evil one, and he slew his brother. And then he raises this question, for what reason did Cain slay Abel? For what reason? Gives the answer. Because Cain's deeds were evil, and his brother's deeds were evil. Righteous. The Lord Jesus Christ is God in human flesh, holiness personified, righteousness personified. Why did the Jews hate him? Why did the Jews hate him to the point, why did his contemporary Jews hate him to the point of 
crucifying him. Same thing. Because he exposed the darkness of the, 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 his contemporary Jews. Why would the entire establishment in the 15th century come again with all its might against Luther? Why would it do that? Same answer. The establishment's deeds were evil. He was righteous. He was exposing their darkness. So they came with their full force to extinguish the light he was bringing. Light always exposes darkness. Therefore, darkness tries to extinguish the light. Dear ones, this morning, I want to ask you a question which is very relevant to us, especially in a church setting. I want to ask you this question. Why do you speak evil of someone? Why do you speak of someone behind their back? The answer is simple. Because they expose your darkness. Dear ones, it's important for us to examine ourselves this morning. We covet a position. We covet something. We want to be the limelight of something. We don't get that. We are envious. So what do we do? We speak evil of someone. We don't want to wait for God's timing. We want to promote ourselves. The way to promote ourselves is bring someone down. And so we speak evil of our brothers and sisters. We are part of God's family. These are our brothers and sisters. These are for whom Christ paid with his blood. He paid for their salvation. We turn up. We speak against them. We persecute them. And in, in doing that, we are actually persecuting Christ. You remember when Stephen was, uh, when, when the Lord confronted Paul, what did he say? He didn't say, Paul, why are you persecuting my church? What did he say? Why are you persecuting me? Any time we speak falsely against a brother or sister, we are actually persecuting Christ. Dear ones, it is very important for us not to persecute our fellow brother or fellow sister. There are ways to deal if you are unhappy with something. It is not the way to falsely speak about them. This morning, let us examine ourselves. Let us ask ourselves this question. Am I a persecutor or am I a persecuted? If you are in a if you are persecuting someone, if you are falsely speaking someone, you are joining the camp of the enemy. That's a terrible thing to, to be in. Promotion always comes from the Lord. We are already what we need to be in Christ. Something else would not define us. Anything in leadership would not define us. We are what we are, need to be already. Our identity is in Christ. If Christ is to desires to exalt us, he will exalt us. Promotion comes from the Lord. He will. 
we don't have to pull somebody down so that we can go up. Promotion comes from the Lord. Trust Him. We are what we need to be already in Christ. Our identity is in Christ. If everything is taken away from us, if my money is gone, if my house is gone, if everything is gone, we are still okay. We are in Christ. Heaven is ours. That's all that we need. We don't need anything in this world. Our identity is in Christ. The moment we see our identity in Christ, we are not trying to impress somebody. We live our lives unto the glory of God and our sole desire is to please Him. Then we will not speak falsely about anybody, unjustly about anybody. As we move on, the exhortation is, as God's people, let us not persecute our brothers and sisters. Let us not speak falsely about our brothers and sisters. Let's say you are persecuted, you are unfairly treated. Unfairly someone is talking about you. What should you do? Two things you must not do. First thing, you must not retaliate. You must not retaliate. Verse 44 in the same chapter. But I say to you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Don't retaliate. Don't try to, don't try to go justify yourself. Don't try to pick a fight. Hey, how come you say these things about me, that things about me? No. You must not do that. No retaliation. Second thing, no resentment, no murmuring. Why is this happening to me? Oh, I'm so faithful. Why is this happening to me? The secret things belong to the Lord. Trust Him. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. Trust Him. In the verses before us, the Lord gives us at least four things positively we must do if we are persecuted as Christians, if we are facing mistreatment as Christians. At least four things. Verse 12, rejoice and be glad. Rejoice and be glad. Not that you are persecuted. Persecution is a bad thing. Don't be happy in persecution. It's not meant to. What are we to be glad about? One of the marks that you are a Christian is this, is this reaction of the world to you. This is like the validation that you are a child of God. See, there are many ways we can know we are Christians. There is a Spirit's witness to us. The world's witness to us also affirms to us we are Christians. How does the world witness? In its hostility. In its enmity. So whenever you persecute it's a badge of honor. That you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. In Galatians chapter 6. The Apostle Paul. In verse 17 says this. From, no, from now on let no one cause me trouble. For I bear in my body the scars of Jesus. What the apostle is saying is, I can physically see the scars because I am a Christian. This scars, every time I see it, it's a witness that I am belonging to another realm. I am a child of God. I am a Christ follower. So whenever someone persecutes you, instead of murmuring, instead of retaliating, this is what you ought to do. I ought to do. This is a badge of honor that I belong 
to the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, what must you do when you are persecuted? Verse 10, blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Whenever you are persecuted, whenever you are mistreated for the sake of Christ, for the sake of righteousness, re recall this. Recall your promised inheritance. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven belongs to you. Recall that. One day, all this trouble will be over. All this pain in this world is over. One day, you are going to enter the gates of glory. One day, you are going to enter perfect righteousness, perfect purity in God's presence. One day, you are going to enter perfect peace, perfect glory. All these sufferings in this present age are not worthy to be compared to the glory that is to reveal to us. Recall the promise of glory. Lift your eyes above this world. Lift, look up. The forerunner has suffered went. He is there at the right hand of God. One day we are also going to be there. This world, our portion is not only to believe on the Lord Jesus, but also to suffer for his namesake. Recall the promise of heaven that one day all these things would be over. And in light of that, live this present world. Have that otherworldly mindset when you are persecuted. Thirdly, the Lord says, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. Thirdly, this is what the Lord says. Remember the reward. You are going to one day enter the immediate presence of God, the glorious presence of God. You are going to have the beautiful vision of God. You will be in His presence, beholding the face of God, beholding the Lamb and His glory in heaven. There is going to be a reward in heaven for you. Remember the reward. The Lord's disciples come to him in Mark chapter 10. And tell him, Lord. Mark chapter 10. James and John. We read from verse 35 onwards. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus saying, Teacher, we want to... We want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. The Lord Jesus said to them, What do you want me to do for you? They, they said to him, Grant that we may sit one at your right, one at your left in your glory. The Lord says, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? What the Lord was saying is, I can't give you what you ask. You are asking me the highest positions in heaven. I can't give you that. It's allotted for someone. And if implied in the text is, whoever suffers more will sit in glory more. He will have promotion in glory more. First the cross, then the crown. Right? That's what he's saying. You know, I'm suffering the most more than anyone else. I'm suffering in the place of sinners. My suffering is uncomparable. Therefore, I have the highest position. Who will have the second, like the next position be below me? It's not you. It is whoever suffers more for Christ's sake. For them, that place is allotted. The divine economy is very different. The more we suffer for being Christians, for, for righteousness' sake, for Christ's sake, the more glory we have in heaven. So remember your reward when you are being persecuted. When you are being mistreated. The Puritans had a great saying. The saying and it comforted them. The Puritans were persecuted immensely. 
they were spoken falsely against immensely. And a lot of them found comfort in this statement. They, they said to each other, there is not only a resurrection of the bodies, but there is a resurrection of reputations. Okay, so let me repeat it. In glory, there is not only a resurrection of body, right? This body, glorious body given, that's not just the only thing. But there is also a resurrection of reputations. Yes, all the manner of evil people speak about you. Now, stay patient. It's okay. There is going to be a redemption of your reputation in heaven. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, In 1 Corinthians 4, this is what he says, verse 5. Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time. Wait until the Lord comes, who will bring forth to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And each man's praise will come to him from God. What, what the apostle is saying is, don't be too quick. There is a day of reckoning. There is a day of judgment. We will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. He will bring every man's motives to light. I live in that confidence. I am not going to self-defend myself. I am not going to, when people say false things about me, I am not going to go and shout loud on the mountain, I am a good man. I will let the Lord deal with it in the resurrection. So as Christians, as we are, when we are unfairly treated, persecuted, rejoice that you are a Christian. This is a proof that you are a Christian. The spirit of God and the spirit of glory rests on you. Recall the promised inheritance of heaven. One day this will all end. You will be in the glorious presence of God. And that will make you long for that day. Remember the reward. The Lord has a reward. More suffering, more glory in heaven. Fourthly, the Lord says, In the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Remember your forerunners. Remember the great company you have. Remember all the Old Testament saints. Remember Abel, righteous Abel. Remember righteous Noah. Remember I Isaiah. Remember Zechariah. All these great saints. The world mistreated them. They are in heaven. Yes, this world has rejected them, but God has exalted them. You are in a company of these persecuted saints. You are not the first one. Find comfort, hope in that truth that you are joining the company of saints who suffered for Christ's sake. Dear ones, this morning, let's ask ourselves this question. Have I faced in some form this hatred from the world? Have I faced it at some form? If you are a true Christian, you would. If you are a true Christian, your own family would turn against you. When you become a Christian, this happens to you. It is inevitable. Can you look back in your face of your life, in, in, in your past and say, you know, I was mistreated, not because of my sin, not because of my mistakes, but truly because I am wanting to walk in the ways of God. I am wanting to follow Christ. Therefore, I am persecuted. Can you remember any, any instance? If you can remember, that's good evidence that you are a Christian. You are truly a child of God. You are not, you're not presumptuous. But if you can't say, no, I've never faced any anything, then there's a good chance you're not a Christian. 
it is inevitable for the Christian to suffer in this world. This morning, let us examine ourselves. Can you see this, this portrait of the Christian with respect to the world in yourself? Are you persecuted? Are you mistreated? If you are not, it's not too late. You can come this morning and you say, Lord, the, the reason I'm not mistreated is because I don't love righteousness. I don't love you. If I do, the world will hate me. Save me, O oh God, have mercy on me. The Lord will have mercy on you. If you are a Christian, yes, you are persecuted, but now you become a persecutor. You speak evil of others. Why are you doing that? It comes back to one thing. Your identity is not in the Lord Jesus. Find your identity in the Lord Jesus. You are all you need to be in Christ. There is nothing that can make you better. You are complete, you are perfect in Christ. If you want something, ask the Lord. He will give you. Promotion comes from the Lord. You don't have to take matters into your own hand and persecute some other brother, some other sister, some other family member in the, in, in the body of Christ. Let us examine this ourselves this morning. Let us find our identity in the Lord Jesus. Let us pray. Our gracious God, our Heavenly Father, our scriptures teach us that we all stumble in many ways. Help us, O oh God, that we would live for righteous sake, righteousness sake in this world. We would be true followers of Christ. Lord, we do not invite suffering. We do not invite persecution. But we know it is inevitable. Lord, when they come to us, Help us to rejoice because they are badges of honor that we belong to you. Help us not to sulk, but help us, O oh God, to see that one day all this suffering would be over. We would be in the glorious bliss, glorious joy. We would be in your perfect happiness. Promote in us that otherworldliness, Lord. Give us grace, Lord. Father, we pray that you would help us to see when we suffer, our reward is great in heaven. Help us, O oh God, to see that we are not the first ones. We join an infinite, an infinite cloud of witnesses. Help us not to have self-pity on ourselves, but help us to join the group of the faithful and rejoice in our privileged position. Father, please give us grace that we would love our brothers and sisters. We would not turn, we would not speak evil against our brothers and sisters and, and so persecute you. Please, O oh God, have mercy on us. Help us to find our identity in the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to be happy. Help us to be content in the Lord Jesus. Oh God, please have mercy upon our souls. Lord, the sin, its deceptiveness, we are not smart enough to figure out its deceptiveness. Oh God, please have mercy on us. Reveal to us our sin. Help us to extinguish the darkness within us and not the light outside. Give us grace, Lord, that we would die to sin and live unto you. Give us grace, O oh God, that we would mortify sin in our fleshly bodies. We ask you for help, O oh Lord. Remember us, O oh Lord, have mercy on us. This morning we pray. Produce the fruit of sanctification, righteousness in our lives. Please help us, O oh Lord. Please help us. We commit ourselves to you this morning. 
in the name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, we pray. Amen.